Let me just review here. And again, some people don't, uh, maybe if you haven't uh, uh, heard the other lessons or messages, I've done three messages um, on uh, another passage here. And uh, the first passage that I had everybody look to was found in uh, Luke chapter 9. And specifically, I focused on Luke 9, verse 23, where the Lord Jesus says, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That was the first message. I actually took this verse and made three messages out of it. The next, so I talked about self-denial, the importance of that. If you're going to be a disciple, you got to deny self. you got to deny self. And that goes against the grain in our world today. Our world is all about ourselves and, you know, self-esteem and all these different things, even though the Bible clearly states that we're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves. And then we talked about that we're supposed to take up our cross daily. Taking up your cross daily, um, as we mentioned, what does it mean? Take up your cross. Think about Jesus Christ. Think about those who were crucified by way of Roman crucifixion. When they uh, died on, they went to a cross. They never came back. They died. They died. It was a place of suffering. It was a place of sacrifice. And uh, so, and he says, we're supposed to deny ourselves uh, and take up our cross daily, every day, every day. And then last week I preached the message on follow me. Follow Jesus Christ. So, so important. Amen. He wants to lead you. And even as John chapter 10 says, hey, if you're his sheep, you will follow him. So I hope and pray that's a reality in your life. So that whole lesson, three lessons, three messages on one verse. And then today we're just going to focus on this verse here in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8. And uh, this passage of scripture here in verse uh, 31 is the one I really want to focus on this morning. And um, so let's just say a few words about that and then. We'll, we'll kind of get into some of the, uh, the meat of that passage here. So in verse uh, in, in John chapter 8, and verse 31, I want you to see some things here. He says, if you continue in my word, you know, and he talks about in the next verse, verse 32, that you'll, you, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know what? God's word, God wants to liberate people. People are in bondage. They're in bondage to their sins, habits, and addictions. That's what they are. People think they're free. I'll go live any way I want. But the Bible tells us that you're not truly free until you, number one, come to Christ, receive him as your Savior, and that you continue in his word. God wants to make you free, he says. He wants to make you free. It's interesting. In verse 31, the Bible says, uh, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. It's interesting in this chapter, John 8, the word if, uh, I believe, appears about 12 times. But let me just share some of those with you. Notice in this verse, of course, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That's the if of discipleship. In uh, verse 36 that I read in the scripture reading, um, if the son therefore make you free, you shall be free, of, free indeed. That's the if of freedom. John chapter 8, verse 39, the Bible says, and I'm just reading parts of these verses, if you if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. That's the if of service. God wants you to serve him. He wants you to be a disciple. He wants you to be free. And the Bible says, look at John 8, 42. John 8, 42. The if, watch this. If God were your father, you would love me. You know what God says? That if he's your father, he expects you to love him. That's the if of sonship, if you're saved. And then uh, John 8, 46, the Bible says, If I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? That's the if of responsibility. And then there's one last if in verse 51. Verse 51 of the same chapter. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. That's God's assurance. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God has given us assurance. Amen. 
The Bible tells us also in John 15, 7, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. I believe that's the principle of continuing in his word. Continuing in his word. Amen. That's what God wants us to do. You know, um, unfortunately, as we've been going through these discipleship lessons in our younger generations today, Unfortunately, not all, but many of the younger generation have no clue about discipline or this aspect of being a disciple. Because unfortunately, many parents did not discipline their kids to begin with. You know what? As parents, let's be reminded that God wants us um, to make sure that we hold our children accountable for their obedience. Amen. And unfortunately, many parents are letting their children run and control their homes. Listen, discipline, discipleship, these are very, very important matters. And uh, so, you know, what does it take to make, to, what does it take to be a disciple? We've already talked about the first one, that if you uh, turn around and you, uh, you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. But the second, this second principle in this one verse is this, that you need to persist or continue in the word of God. You need to continue. When we continue in his word, he says we are his disciples. So if you continue in his words, it's important. It is important that we on a daily basis, that we uh, are consistent each and every day. See, this, can, this thing about continuing, let me give you some some thoughts here t today about this. First of all, the Bible teaches us that we need, that if you have continuous reading of the word of God, it produces discipleship. Even as Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13, he says, till I come, give attendance to reading. See, that's the same thing that Jesus says, continuing in my word. You know, every day we need to be cleansed. The word of God the Bible says is like a mirror. It's like a mirror. And it, it, it shows us who we really are and what we're really like and our needs. And we need to open the book. As a matter of fact, and I'll give you that reference, James chapter 1, verse 25, I believe it is. James 1, 25. The Bible says, whoso, James 1, 25, but whoso looketh into, looketh into. Notice he didn't say, Whoso look at that. In other words, just look at your Bible. No, God wants you to dig deeper. He wants you to look into the passages that you are reading. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in deed. He's saying you'll be blessed in obedience. You need to continue in it. The perfect law of liberty. Notice, again, with the passage in John 8, there's liberation. God wants to liberate you, amen? Liberate you from all that the world wants to put you into bondage, amen? So open, and he says, if you look into the perfect law of liberty, notice verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So he's using the illustration, James, of the mirror. So when we look in the mirror, uh, why are you looking in the mirror? You want to make sure everything looks right. Amen. You just got up. You're getting ready for the day. So you look over yourself. God says you need to look over yourself spiritually. Are you are you okay? Or are there some things you need to look after? Some things you need to take care of right now in your life. You know what? As soon as you know, see, the problem is sometimes we don't spend time in that book. And as a result, we're not allowing God to reveal to us in our hearts um, some of those areas of our life that need to be taken care of. And so it's so, so important. Some people wait for church to open their Bible. So sad, so sad. Listen, you have opportunity. There's so many tools out there, you know, um, not only the printed Bible, but you, there's these Bible apps that you can use that you can do devotions and read through the word of God. We need to, we need to. Uh, be reading the word of God. What else? So when we see ourselves, if we keep that thought in mind with James chapter 1, verse 23,
He says, you're going to behold your natural face in a glass. So what else does God talk about? So not only should we read it, we continue in it. Amen. Look into the perfect law of liberty on a daily basis. We need a daily cleansing. We need a daily counseling session from God. That's what God wants to do. And he wants to walk and talk with you. Amen. And But number two, not only do we need continuous reading, but we need continuous repentance. Continuous repentance. You know, there's some things we need to change our minds about. A change of mind that leads in a change in direction and a change in, in your walk. Amen. You know what? Um, in that James 1 passage, the glass, the mirror, again, what do you do when God shows you something? What do you do when you come to church and you hear a message preached and God touches your heart? The Holy Spirit of God touches your heart. What do you do with it? You just walk away? Just ignore it? No, God wants you to do something about it. Let's not just be hearers, but doers of the word. We got too many hearers and not enough doers. Amen. I, you know, it's great to know the word of God. It's, it's great to know these truths. It's great to maybe even accumulate knowledge, but be careful. Knowledge puffeth up. But God doesn't want you just to hear, but he wants you to do, to do today. Amen. Um, Isaiah chapter 6. There's a great famous passage of mine that I love looking at. In Isaiah 6, what we have is Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died. So um, so here is Isaiah. He thinks about the time when the king died. You know what? All of us in our realm of politics and kings and queens down through the millennia, we've had our favorite, favorite leader. But you know what? When they're dead and gone, who do you look to? Who do you look to? We got too many Christians focused on politics and not on the word of God. Amen. Listen, I, I'm, a, I'm a Canadian citizen. I vote. I exercise that freedom, that liberty that we have. I thank God we have it. But my hope's not in a prime minister, president, king, or queen. My hope is in the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to look up. So what happened was King Uzziah died and Isaiah was a little bit down in the dumps, discouraged. And uh, he says he saw the Lord sitting, verse 1, on a throne high and lifted up and his train that filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. And he goes through all of this and he says in verse 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the Bible says down in verse 5, then said I, so when he got a proper view uh, of God, and again, if we can just see ourselves the way God sees us, I believe verse 5 will come into play. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of un a people of unclean lips. Amen. That's the midst of a crooked, perverse nation, Philippians 2.15, Titus 2.12. Amen. You say, I don't know how we can all do it as Christians. Listen, this book transcends time and culture. I don't care what country you're from. I don't care what, what, what century you're living in. The Bible still is for us today. It works if you make it work. Amen. If you live these truths out, God can work in your heart. So the Bible says that God moved in the heart of Isaiah to move him from a state of depression and discouragement and when he saw the Lord on his throne, amen. And then what happens after that is amazing too. Verse eight, and I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Amen. You know what? He goes from a place of discouragement and depression to a place of serving God, getting up, getting up, even as Elijah in 1 Kings 19, amen. You know what? A continuous this, this, the word of God will bring repentance. Amen. If we act upon and that in itself with uh, the reading of the word, and I got a few more here to share with you, will bring, will produce discipleship in your life. Let's look at the third thing. Not only a continuous reading, but a continuous repentance. The word of God, it's, it's an amazing book, but a continuous reverence. Keep your place in John 8. We'll probably come back to that, but go to Psalm 128. Psalm 128. Now let me ask you a question before I read Psalm 128. Psalm 128. 
Okay, let me just uh, <clears throat> let me just ask you a question. I'm sorry, not 120, 138, 138. I was wondering, I'm looking at 128, 138. Okay, let me read a passage to you, and I want you to think about this passage first. Uh, everyone knows this passage. I'll read it to you. Okay. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Who is he? Jesus. And given him a name which is above every name. How high is that name? It's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under earth. I think he covered it all pretty well. No matter where you are, Hey, listen, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow someday. All, every unbeliever, every infidel who denies Jesus Christ, who he is. He's God, the son, the son of God. And the Bible says his name is above every name. Okay. Well, we all understand that, but we also fail to understand this next passage. Back to Psalm 138. The Bible says, verse two, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Watch this. For thou has magnified thy word above all thy name. How about that? God says, what's even higher than the name of Jesus, his own word? By the way, what good, you know, how can I say it? What good is your name if your word's no good? Amen. Thank God we have a book. The Bible, we can trust it. We can believe it. Um, we can claim its promises. God's word is true. Amen. We change from day to day. Amen. But God's word does not change. He's magnified. He's lifted his name. Amen. You know what? That is, this is an amazing book. You know what? We need to magnify uh, this word, God's word, above what the world calls science that hasn't been proven and tested. The Bible calls that in Paul's letter to Timothy. It's science, falsely so-called. We need to lift up his word, amen? We need to magnify his word above success in life. And, you know, people are looking for attention. Um, go to Joshua chapter one. This is my, my life verse, Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one, verses eight and nine. I love these two verses. Joshua chapter one. The Bible says this, or, or verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written. Not just some of it, not just the parts you like. I've had Christians tell me, I don't like the Old Testament. I don't want to read the Old Testament. Listen, we need to read all of it. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All of it is inspired, not just the parts you like, not just the parts you want to read. Every verse is important. You say, I don't know when I'll ever use that verse. And I have the same question sometimes, but don't worry, it's important. You better read it. God preserved it for us. You better read it. And he says this, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. May not be, you know, lots of money and lots of stuff, but in God's eyes, prosperity is different. And then he says this, and then thou shalt have good success. The only place in the whole Bible where God mentions the word success is found in connection to the word of God. The word of God. Wow. Praise the Lord. You know what? Today, it's important for us to wreck. We need to magnify it over the world's idea of success. God's idea of successfulness is those who continue in his word, who love his word, who live his word, who meditate on his word. Amen. Praise God for that. So we see there needs to be a continue. You say, well, continue in my word. Then are you my disciples indeed, he said in John 8, 31. That's a continuous reading. That's a continual, continuous repentance. That's a continual reverence. What else is there? How about this? A continuous rising. 
a continuous rising. Again, we're in the Old Testament, but again, keep your place over in Deuteronomy 6, or uh, John 8. But look at Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. I love this passage. It preached many lessons. A lot of times when you talk about the home and the family, these verses come up. And uh, so uh, watch this. In this passage of Scripture, in verses 1 down to verse um, 6 or 5, what he's doing, he's commanding the parents. He's commanding the adults. You know what? Listen, I do not for a second think that it's impossible for a young person to rise above their parents in spirituality. There are children, I have, I have remember over the years working in the bus ministry, working with children in children's church and junior church and all of these things many years ago back in Niagara Falls. You know what? There were kids that came out of terrible home situations that got saved. And some of them today we, we know of that are serving God. You know what? You can come out of those types of situations and live for God. But I, as I said so many times, I don't want to be the one to discourage any young person, any young person at all from serving God. And by the way, that starts in the home. That starts with you, dad. That starts with you, mom. By the way, God called you men to be the head of your home. That's what God said. And so it's important for us to lead our children, lead our children in prayer, lead our children in the word. That's what God wants. This is what God wants us to do. And so, again, I, you know, you, you want your kids to serve God? Then you need to serve God. You need to serve the Lord. You need to put God. So he commanded the parents first. And that's what he does in verses 1 through 5. And he tells them, he tells them that they need to look at verse uh, 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. So he tells the parents this. And then he turns around and he says this. And verse 6, and these words, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Listen, let's stop there for a minute. You may say, I don't have any kids. I don't have any children. You know what? God can use you to teach younger people in the children's church, in a children's ministry, in Sunday school, in a toddler program. Amen. You know what? Young people are looking at you as an adult. You say, I don't have any children. Maybe you, you cannot have children. Maybe you can, you know, you're not going to adopt any. But you know what? There's young people looking at you. There's young people looking at you. And if you're saved, God wants you to be that proper example and pattern to young people, younger people. The older men should be a good pattern to the younger man. The older women should be a, a good pattern to the younger woman. Amen. So he tells these parents here. So let's not let's not. Uh, excuse ourselves and say, well, I don't have any kids, so this doesn't apply. No, you have an effect. Someone's watching you. Someone's looking at you. Well, they say, well, they should be watching Jesus. I know, but you know what? Let's be a good example. I don't want to discourage anybody from serving God. And he says this, and he says that, that teach them diligent. Let's be diligent with this, verse 7. Unto thy children, thou shalt talk to them. With, now watch this. When thou sittest in thine house. So when you're sitting in your house, you talk about the Lord. What do you talk about? It doesn't have to be 24-7, but do you talk much at all as an parent, as an adult, as an older man, an older woman? Like, what, what are you talking about? You know what? The What you talk about is what you've heard and seen on social media and news media. It has an effect. What you talk about today, I hope you can talk about God because you spent time with God this week. Amen. What have you watched? What have, have you looked at, at things that are edifying and godly? We need to be careful what media we, we engage in. And he says, when you're sitting, when thou walkest, when thou liest down, and when thou riseth up. You know what God wants you to do? Listen, he wants you to rise up. That's what he wants you to do. See, this, this is a continuous rising. This is what the word of God will do for us. It will carry you above the world's delights. It will carry you above the world's deeds in this world. It will carry you above the world's designs. Listen, this word of God will help you, will strengthen you 
Amen. It'll help you to go to work tomorrow if you're working tomorrow. Amen. Or this week. It'll help you. It'll help young people in, in, in the secular uh, government education or in university. It will help you, but you've got to spend time in the word of God. See, he said, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That's a continuous reading, a continuous repentance, a continuous reverence, a continuous rising. What else? It's a continuous releasing. Praise God. Let's go back to the John 8 passage and we'll wrap up today. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Look at those verses again. In John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I got to get my place. I lost my mark. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 8. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now watch this. So there's an actual connection. That's why even in recovery ministries, faith-based recovery ministries, there is a lot of connection to the word of God. When people are going through this, it is of paramount importance that people who have addictions uh, and habits in life, that they spend time in the word of God. Amen. But you know what? Not just for those with those problems or those challenges. It's important for all of us because when we don't, we put ourselves into bondage and God wants to make us free here. See the next verse? The next verse says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And look what he says in that last verse, verse 36. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. See, continuing, continuing, continuing in the word of God, continuing in his word will free you from the power of sin. You think, oh, it's so hard out there. It's so hard. Are you calling yourselves a Christian? Do you know Jesus Christ as your savior? Have you received Jesus Christ? Have you realized that you're a sinner lost without Jesus Christ, that if you died today without Jesus, you would end up in a place called hell. But Christ died on the cross for your sins, paid for those sins, every one of them, no matter what your past is. Amen. He can forgive you. And then the Bible says, if you would just realize that all you got to do is by a simple faith transaction, ask, receive Jesus Christ as your savior, put your complete faith and trust in him, not in anything that you've ever done or could do, because you cannot do enough to save your own soul. That's what salvation is. And that's why Jesus came. He came to save people from their sins. That includes everybody on planet earth. Everyone needs to be saved. He's the son of man who came to seek and to save that which was lost. We were all lost. One of the greatest challenges I find as a pastor is to get people to realize that their present condition without Christ, that they are lost. Too many people are trusting in their own righteousness. You know, we uh, this week I went down to the men's retreat and uh, Brother uh, Charlie Clark uh, Sr., um, he did the, uh, the, the teaching to the men and it was so helpful. It was so helpful. And um, it helped me a lot. You know, you know, pastors need to be preached at. And uh, so he quoted this passage. It was interesting. And I, I, I just, Jesus, he spake in Luke 18, 9. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You know what the problem is today? People are trusting in themselves that they're good enough to save their own soul. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's just the world there. That's just the devil coming in. That's just the flesh that tells you, oh, you're good enough. No, you are not. You need Jesus. You need his righteousness. You need to trade. The Bible even says in Isaiah 64, 6, that our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. you got to turn to Jesus Christ. When you do that, God saves your soul. And when God saves your soul, he has given you everything you need that pertains to life and godliness. There's not anything, there's not anything that you don't have 
that God hasn't given you. You have everything he wants you to have. The problem is not that we don't have what God wants us to have. It's not we're not appropriating what God has done in our lives the moment we were saved. Oh, the Bible says that God wants you to be have a continuous releasing every day. Releasing you. That's why Paul said, he says, I die daily. He crucified his flesh. Amen. Every day he had to put it down. He had to realize who's going to win today. It's either going to be the Lord or my own flesh. It's going to be the old man or the new man. It's going to be the flesh or it's going to be the spirit. And what we got to do is we got to put it down. We got to put it down. We got to say no to that old man, the old flesh. Amen. That's what we need to do. And it will free you from sins, the power of sin in your life. It will also free you from Satan's persuasions. He wants to persuade you. You know, he's he's good at it. He's really good at it. He'll talk you in things. And uh, I listen, if he can if he can talk Eve into taking the fruit that God said that they weren't supposed to take, don't ever think that you yourself are greater, more spiritual than Eve in the garden. No. No, none of us are. Even Paul said he puts no confidence in the flesh. Neither should any believer. No one should put confidence in their flesh. Amen. But Satan. And then, of course, society's pressures. Amen. Not only sin's power, Satan's persuasions, but society's pressures. In Romans chapter 12, I love these passages here. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. This is, a, this is an amazing passage. You know, for ten, for 11 chapters, Paul uh, brings arguments in to help people realize that, you know what? We're all lost in our sin. Amen. And he builds a case and he, he goes right through for 11 chapters. Amen. Building this case. And then he says, I beseech you, therefore. What's the beseech you? Chapters 1 through 11. I beg and plead. You need to look back. You need to read those. Amen. He says, because of everything that I've said that God has done, if you're saved, amen, everything that God's done, he says, I beseech you, I beg with you, I plead with you, brethren, by the mercies of God, in Romans 12, 1, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. He's not going to make you do it. He wants you to do it willingly. Present yourself to him. Amen. This is not salvation. This is after salvation. Say, Lord, I'm yours. Sometimes, you know, it's easy to Trust him with your soul, but are you trusting him with your life, with your life, with the day-to-day -day challenges that you face in this world today, in the workplace, in the home, in your home, your family, your marriage, with your children, with your spouse, all these challenges, amen? We need to trust him with our life. We need to say, hey, yes, Lord, I will present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The Bible says God is a reasonable God. He will never re expect or require of us anything that is unreasonable. People think some things that God expects of us is, is unreasonable, but it's not. He is not. He's a reasonable God. And then he says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be careful what you put in that mind. That mind also is connected to your heart. It will affect your heart. Whatever you watch, whatever you see, whatever you hear, Oh, guard yourself. He says, be not conformed. That means this. If you don't actively choose to uh, focus on the right things, you will be attacked. You will be, listen, probably conformed by this world. He says, be not. It's a negative cap command. Be not conformed to this world. We need to be active every day dealing with the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word transform there is the same word for that word transform is metamorphosis. That butterfly, eh? you know, that cocoon stage, that butterfly coming, a caterpillar. How about that? A butterfly? What a change. God says that can be you. Amen. Transform by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, today. Can you, can you today realize how important it is, how important it is to spend time in the word of God? Let me read that John 8, 31, and we're done today. 
Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, have you believed on him? He says, okay, now that you're saved, here's what you need to do. Amen. We talked about, you know, denying yourself, taking up your cross daily and following Christ. And now Jesus says, hey, discipleship. There's, there's even some more, more about this here. Okay. Continue in my word. Then are ye my disciples indeed. That's what God wants. That's what God wants for you today. Will you do it today if you're saved? Will you spend more time in the word today? Will you trust God? Listen, when the flesh says, ah, you don't need the word today, the day that you choose not to spend in the word of God, I guarantee you there'll be something that will come in, the, in your routine of life that you'll face as a challenge. And you probably will say, I wish I would have spent time with God today. You need to spend time with the Lord. Amen. Oh, so, so important. You want to be a disciple? Continue in his word. Amen.